This video is sponsored by Skillshare. They're giving away a free month to my subscribers if you use the link in the description. The human brain. From the moment you're born to the moment you die, the brain works 24 seven on less power than a light bulb, only ever briefly shutting down when you take a test or talk to someone attractive. The brain is responsible for astounding feats of genius like these. Catch me in the coat. Oh my God, babe. <laughs> I think we played the wrong clips there, uh, but no, no, it's okay. I can work with this. Even this idiocy takes an incredible amount of processing power. He has a goal. He's processing the input of light and recognizing his surroundings. He's using his nerves to dexterously manipulate the lighter. He contextualizes the causal relationships between his tools. He senses the heat to determine the level of danger he's in and overcomes the fear of getting his face burned off to achieve this goal, all while his autonomic nervous system keeps his heart pumping and lungs working. The point is even when we're being stupid, we're way smarter than computers. Watson, who is Franz Liszt? Who is the church lady? What is narcolepsy? You are right. Who is in charge of these clips? No, 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 I can work with this. IBM's Watson AI winning Jeopardy is a preview to how superhuman machine intelligence can be in specific or narrow applications. It's called narrow AI for that reason, but a brain has general intelligence and runs on just 20 watts of power in contrast to the 85,000 watts that Watson was using. Here's how well Watson did on 20 watts. What are boobs was every answer. Ironically, uh, he was right once. Power consumption is a huge problem when it comes to scaling up AI systems. You can see that even though we will soon match the brain in calculations per second, we're not on track to do so at the brain's power level. This means with current technology, powering computers in 2035 will take more energy than the world is capable of producing. So to meet these challenges, we need to think less like Watson and more like foot torch guy. We need to design computers that function like brains. It's called neuromorphic computing. But why does it matter to you? Well, I'll let quantum physicist and huge fan of teasing his cat with a laser, Michio Keiku, explain. The fourth wave of wealth generation, the great fortunes that don't even exist yet. The fourth wave is physics at the molecular level, meaning artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, and biotechnology. Neuromorphic computing encompasses all three of these, and investing in the first companies to master this is probably a great way to get rich. And being rich helps a lot when your brain shuts down in front of someone attractive. Money might also help you survive the knee of the curve. <laughs> Welcome! Welcome to Knee of the Curve. I'm Emmett Short, keeping you up to speed on how fast you're being left behind. This show is made possible by our amazing patrons. If you enjoy yourself and want to become a producer and get some cool perks, check out the link to Patreon in the description. If you'd like to support the channel while also turning yourself a tidy little profit, check out my recent video on Dow Ventures, Crypto Wealth Managers. And you can invest in the metaverse. You could pay zero gas fees while you do it. And we both make 10% on your deposit if you follow the instructions in that video and the description down below. Finally, upgrade your brain with a free month of Skillshare Premium using my link down below. And as always, share this video with a fellow futurist. Okay, let's do this. To understand why designing chips based on the brain is better, you have to first understand what it's better than. Since 1945, we've been using the von Neumann architecture, named after Seinfeld's nemesis. No, no, that's not him. Yeah, yeah, 
that guy, John von Neumann. He created an architecture which consists of a processing unit, a memory, and input and output mechanisms. This was super smart for 1945, but turns out having the memory separate from the processors creates a bottleneck, so they named that after him too. The bottleneck happens because no matter how fast your processor is, it's limited by the speed the memory can shuffle through this one channel. Computers essentially suck all the ones and zeros through one straw, and our solution to this bottleneck so far has been just to suck harder. Well, we did try shortening the straws. Systems on a chip now smash GPU, caches, neural engines, and distributed memory all onto one chip to cut down latency and power consumption. But even this method can't match the brain. 85 to 100 billion neurons in your brain and each and every one of them are very social, living organisms with teeny tiny, adorable little agendas. Each neuron is like a bouncer that knows your name. You don't have to wait in line. He doesn't have to check your ID or hold it up and make sure it's you or that you're on the list. He just goes, I know you, get in here. They each have a cell body, which is the processor, an axon, which is the data bus, just a nerdy term for a wire, and synapses, which are the memory. These synapses wire together and are shared between tens of thousands of other neurons, but each unit contains both processor and memory and is what is called a neurosynaptic core. Back to the straw analogy, each straw or neuron specializes in a memory. Like if you're sucking up alphabet soup, this straw gets the A and this straw gets the Z and everything in between. 86 billion straws later, you finish the bowl in one suck. By the way, if we could start defining power usage in units of sucks, I might get a law. Short's Law of Sucks. Think about it. Up to now, we've been using software to simulate neurons on von Neumann architecture. It's been working great, driving cars, discovering new drugs, writing episodes of Knee of the Curve. But when things are either one or zero, you wind up with the most literal mind possible. Hey, cousin. This is my cousin and he takes everything literally. Hey man, uh, drop your stuff, make yourself comfortable. No, no, don't take your pants off. You said get comfortable. You have to watch what you say to a mind like that or it might turn out racist or, well, racist or even, yep, racist again. Can we take a moment to appreciate something? I know we live in a world where if something is bad, it's all bad, and if something is good, we probably just haven't read its old tweets. But this AI can diagnose skin cancer. Yeah, only in white people. But that shouldn't stop us from being impressed by how amazing it is that we've created an artificial intelligence even capable of being an asshole. It's pretty mind-blowing. Anyway, scaling up our units of suckage is not gonna solve AI racism, it's gonna make AIs better at being racist. So, we gotta try something else. Besides, as I mentioned, scaling up this method is computationally expensive and is gonna tap out the entire world's energy supply by around 2035. Case in point, Elon Musk recently tweeted about Tesla's Dojo supercomputer and how it's fast enough to simulate a human brain. Impressive, but that system does fill up a giant building and sucks down 1.2 million watts of energy. This bad boy, 20 watts. And despite what my ex-girlfriends would tell you, it fits inside most buildings. To accomplish that feat, the brain has another key design feature. The neurons are chilling out, hardly expending any energy until they get hit with signals from their surrounding buddies. It's called a spiking neural network. So information spikes only those neurons most relevant to it and moves through the brain in highly efficient waves as it's processed. Not only is it efficient, but this is the only way we know of that consciousness emerges. A good analogy for a classical computer is this cathedral built with instructions passed down one by one according to the design. Termite cathedrals, on the other hand, are built without a blueprint. No one's in charge, just thousands of individuals coalescing and the structure emerges. So it stands to reason that neuromorphic architecture gives us the best shot at creating an emergent AI consciousness that can replicate human thought, perception, and behavior. 
It's not a guarantee. I mean, it's hard. Some humans can't do it. Welcome everyone to today's hearing on Facebook, social media privacy, and the use and dish and abuse of data. Although not unprecedented, this is a because you're human, and, and I was human. I am human, still. Um, but, um, but, it, but I was just referring to myself in the past. Um, not that I was not human. Okay. <laughs> Whatever you say, dude. Money can do a lot of things. I hope one day it makes the Zuck a real boy. Dreams do come true. Speaking of money, if you're looking to throw money at this tech, the leading publicly traded companies that are actively pursuing this are Intel, IBM, Qualcomm, Hewlett Packard, and Brainship. If you'd like me to do another video talking about the different approaches these and other institutions are pursuing, let me know. It's definitely enough for an entire video, but I'll highlight two real quick. Intel's low E heat chips are a thousand times faster and 10,000 times more efficient. Asynchronous design is a completely different way of designing chips that doesn't use a clock. It's inspired more directly from how the brain works. With neuromorphic chips, we're creating a huge parallel sea of neurons where each one operates without any prescribed order. Intel's chips do still run on electricity, not miniature chicks in bathing suits. That would be crazy, but one researcher at UCLA is doing something almost as crazy. The structure of these chips is based off of neurons. So we're taking biological inspiration and then applying it to an inorganic system that we could use for computing. These look like neurons and synapses in the brain. Mm -hmm. They look completely biological. You coat a silicon wafer with some sort of polymer and shine UV light on it. Okay. And depending on what pattern um, this light has been shown through, you can get these highly patterned electrodes. You have a copper grid, essentially tiny little posts, and these are the seed sites. It's a seed that is going to, from which everything is going to it grow. It will grow. This is nanotechnology. Ooh, I think I've seen this movie. I'm sure it'll end well. These chips are gonna give your self-driving electric car more brains and more range. They'll give robots a sense of touch through the ability to map sensors in synthetic skin and a bunch more cool shit. Not only could investing in this make you rich, but it could help us not have World War III over power consumption in 2035. So I say we bet on these guys and we bet big. But this is not financial advice, although you'd be stupid not to. I'm kidding, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just, you know, kind of a dick. No stupids allowed. This entire episode has been about building a better brain and that's essentially Skillshare's product. If you haven't done the trial yet, you really just owe it to yourself. It's so nice. The first thousand of my subscribers to use my link get a one month subscription for free to Skillshare Premium. There's a ton of classes for creative stuff, but they also have like code writing or how to do your taxes better. The classes are extremely high quality. You don't have to sit through any ads for anything. You just get straight to the knowledge. Basically, if you're into learning and not wasting time, then this is it. And it, it's a free trial, perfect. Big thanks to Ryan Stout and Brad Howard for their help researching and writing this episode. Hit that subscribe button for more super nerdy stuff. Think about joining Patreon. It's not the worst idea you've ever had and leave a comment, tell me what you thought, or come join me on Discord and tell me what altcoins you're into.